So my name is Melissa Shepard, and like she mentioned, I work with Dr. Noyes and Dr. Robert Antabaka in surgical oncology. They were both conveniently out of the country and out of the out of town for this, so I'll attempt to muddle through this and give you an idea more on the surgical aspect of treatments of where we're at, and particularly two of the main studies that we have going on right now at the Huntsman. Uh, first in, uh, concerning sur uh, the surgical aspect of melanoma. One, a very large international study, and one that's just starting up that was developed here at the Huntsman. Currently, surgical treatment for melanoma consists of two things. First, a white excision. So we're surgically removing the tumor along with an extra amount of tissue of skin around the melanoma. This to both ensure we got all the melanoma excised as well as to help prevent local recurrence in that area. The second, is to at least discuss sentinel, a sentinel lymph node biopsy. So as many of you have lived through this and know exactly what that is, but the sentinel lymph node is take a biopsying the, the node that drains where the melanoma was and evaluating if there's any uh, melanoma cells in there or any lymphatic spread of the melanoma. The importance of this is we know in patients with early melanoma, the status of their lymph node, if there's any lymph node spread, is the most important prognostic factor that we can make available for that patient. Now this is a very broad diagram just for separating patients with a positive node and a negative node, but looking at their overall survival, showing the significance and the importance of finding this out. So if we can detect, it helps us in these early melanomas decide who um, would be most beneficial to send on for further treatments at a time when it's early and they're most likely to be responsive to these treatments. So the initial diagnosis happens, biopsy showing melanoma. The patients come to us, and we know that approximately 15% of these patients will have a positive sentinel lymph node. So we need to determine who will most likely benefit from this procedure. So this is a general graph, kind of or this is a graph showing the per in percentages the chances of having a positive sentinel lymph node based on that original biopsy of the melanoma. Now the most determinant of this is how deep the melanoma is. Um, the arbitrary number that we use is if the chances of having a positive sentinel lymph node is 5% or greater, we think it's, um, we do highly recommend a sentinel node biopsy. So for instance, a stage 1A, which is a melanoma that's less than one millimeter and has no other negative prognostic features, the chance of it spreading is about, in about 4%, where in a stage 1B, you're looking more at around 11%. To further kind of determine who we want to have a sentinel to, who we want to evaluate their lymph nodes. So as you know with melanoma, we're not as worried about how the diameter of the melanoma, or how big it is on the outside. We're more worried about how invasive it is in the skin. And how we classify those is the, is the Breslow depth or thickness. Uh, less, uh, less than one millimeter in depth is a thin melanoma. One to four millimeters in depth is a moderate thickness melanoma. And greater than four millimeters in depth is a thick melanoma. All patients with a melanoma greater than one millimeter should be a candidate and have the discussion to have a sentinel lymph node biopsy. If it's a thin melanoma or less than one millimeter, there's other things we look at, and particularly in the pathology. The two major things with our new staging system is looking at whether it was ulcerated or it had a high mitotic count, which is the, cellular the rate of cellular division. Other determining factors that um, we think should have a sentinel lymph node is every case should be individual. And different things, like if we don't know the true depth of the melanoma, so it's cut off at the bottom, younger age, younger age, you are at more risk for having a positive sentinel biopsy. So a lot of things go into determining whether we should evaluate that sentinel lymph node. So the concept behind this is, of a sentinel node, is that that portion of the skin where the melanoma is drains to a certain lymph node. And it's usually between one and five lymph nodes, and we call those the sentinel lymph nodes. Now, the sentinel lymph node is mo the lymph node most likely to contain metastatic disease if there is any. And by taking out just those few lymph nodes instead of the entire lymph node basin, we can accurately stage that regional uh, nodal basin and save them from a much bigger surgery. Now, again, I know many of you have been through this, but just to kind of reiterate how we find and how we isolate these sentinel lymph nodes. The first thing we do is typically done the day before is a lymphoscintigraphy, and that's the injection of a sulfur colloid, which is a, a colloid, which is a radioactive substance into the melanoma the day before in nuclear medicine. And you get four injections right around where that melanoma was. They're able to follow it through the lymphatic vessels and settle into the lymph nodes. 
they believe that we find the correct sentinel lymph node about 90% of the time with this procedure. So to increase the odds on that, the second thing he do, they do in the OR is he injects a 1% isosulfan blue solution, again, right around the melanoma site. So he has two ways of finding and isolating that sentinel lymph node to know which ones to remove. So as you can see, the gamma probe right there, and then the, um, the blue dye. So the gamma probe, they, ha they can con or, um, evaluate the radioactivity to follow it underneath the skin to find where the appropriate lymph node basin is. Once it's open, so you can see two ways of finding the sentinel lymph nodes. You can see the blue coloration at the top, as well as the gamma probe at the bottom is, is checking for radioactivity. So if the sentinel lymph node is blue, radioactive, or both, they're removed. It does not mean there's cancer in it. This is just the roadmap to find the sentinel lymph node, to send it to the pathology to be evaluated for any, any melanoma cells involved. All right, so surgical management. Once we know the status, once we know if there's a sentinel node involved, two things happen. If there's no evidence of melanoma, the node is negative. No further surgeries are recommended at that time, just close ob observation to evaluate for recurrence. If there are any identifiable melanoma cells or it's node positive, the recommendation is, is to have a second surgery, so a complete lymph node dissection, to go back in the same scar and remove the rest of the lymph nodes in that area. Standard of care right now. So this brings us to our first study. We know that when we go back and we remove the rest of the lymph nodes, which is a bigger surgery, has more complications to it, that most of the time, so 88, depending on the study, 8 to 33% of the time, there are no further lymph nodes with melanoma in it. So it brings up our first important question in the surgical world. Do all patients that have a positive sentinel lymph node need to undergo a second surgery and have a complete lymph node dissection? We know most of the time we don't find any more melanoma cells, but we don't know its impact on overall survival. So it's the, sorry. So this, the first study is the multicenter selective lymphadenectomy trial, or, either, or easily known as MSLT2. And this is how it's set up. After we know the sentinel node status, so if the sentinel lymph node is positive, they, they are randomized. And 50% of the patients have the standard of care that you would normally get, have a complete lymph node dissection of the rest of the lymph nodes removed in that lymph node basin. The other 50% are randomized to ultrasound follow-up. So they'll get routine for the next five years ultrasound evaluation of that area and only have the complete lymph node dissection if any recurrence is found. The second part, exciting part of the study, trying to detect this earlier, is we're looking under our current technology of just looking under a microscope and seeing if there's any identifiable melanoma cells. Is there a way that we can er detect earlier? So right now, if the sentinel lymph node is negative, it is sent on for molecular, more molecular evaluation, where they actually look at the RNA of the cells in the lymph nodes to see if they can detect earlier any melanoma cells. So this is called the RT-PCR testing. If this is found in the lymph nodes, or if it is PCR positive, then they're lumped back into that randomization group and randomized to either complete lymph node dissection or the ultrasound follow-up. So we're trying to find out the significance of this as well. If we can find out if there's early melanoma in these cells, does it as well uh, affect overall survival and if this is an earlier way for us? Now this is a, this is a large international trial. It's going to be going over, t over 10 years. It started in, we started here in 2006. We're about four years into it. Seven years of accrual and three year of follow-up. The goal is for a total of 2,100 patients in the screening phase and 1,900 to randomize. At the Huntsman Cancer Institute, we have, as of Friday, 390 enrolled. This is the highest, yeah, they always, this is the big uh, point for the surgeons, the highest at one site anywhere in the United States and the second highest internationally just behind Australia. So, but of course with anything, we do have shortcomings to our current technology. And this is where our second large trial comes into play. So currently, the blue dye, or the 1% um, isosulfan blue injection, does have some limitations. It is definitely in short supply at times. It can cause skin necrosis, which is dying off of the skin, which we have occasionally seen. And the other big thing is tattooing. So the, inject the blue dye is a permanent tattoo. Now, normally this is not a big deal with melanoma, 
we have to remove that white excision around it anyway, so we take it out. But occasionally, as you can see at the injection site, it likes to bleed into the tissues quite a bit. This becomes a problem when you're dealing with an area on the face, on the foot, someplace that's hard to bring that tissue back together and you want to take out as least amount as possible. Oftentimes, this will bleed out too much and he, they have to take more than they expected. So this is, this is a common problem and sometimes people are just left with a permanent blue dye, blue, ta blue tattoo around it. It does have about a 2% of anaphylactic or a severe allergic reaction rate to it. The uh, radioactive substance, the sulfur choline, is oftentimes in short supply and it, provide, it requires a radio pharmacy, which is a particular problem when you're dealing with in remote areas. Um, like I know in St. George, off, um, some of the surgeons that do, that do this procedure often have trouble getting um, the uh, radioactive material to perform this. So the solution has been developed, that we're attempting, that we're testing right now has been developed here at the Huntsman Cancer Institute. And Dr. Robert Antabaka has been the primary um, investigator in this. So the, the um, thought is instead is to use a fluorescent compound. So fluorescein has been around for a long time. It has a very, very low reaction rate as far as um, allergic reaction to it. We know it's very, very safe. And it is a clear substance and only shows up, as you can see in the picture, underneath a black light. Also, you can see it, instead of having to detect the radioactivity through the skin to find that nodal basin, you can see it is shown transdermally through the skin. It's also much, much cheaper. And um, you're going to see some pictures here. All these pictures are of a uh, swine model. You can see, so that yes, that is a pig leg, 23. You can see the fluorescein at the injection site. And as you can see, this is the lymphatic vessels running from the primary site of injection going to the nodal basins. You can see it dermally through the skin. Right here, you can see this is a tissue with the two lymph nodes on the side. You can see how they are highlighted and how easily they're seen. And again, running, running through, and that's the white excision site, the opening. We'll see if this should run. So this is live video, and particularly in a dark skin pig. There was some worry if this would show up through darker skins, and you'll see it coming through. Okay. <laughs> so just so you can actively see the flow through the skin, through the lymphatic vessels, going up to the lymph node. So, so far, very good success with this. And I can tell you, Dr. Antabaka gets angsty now when he has to use the blue dye. He's very much, he's been very happy with this. So pretty exciting though. <laughs> so we enrolled our first patient approximately a year ago. To date, we have 80 enrolled. Our goal is 100, so we're almost to the end of our phase two. So far, no problems, no necrosis of the skin, no adverse reactions, no allergic reactions whatsoever that we found. And the exciting part is, is it has worked in all body parts and it has seen, been seen in all patients. There was a concern whether darker skin, whether bigger body habitus, we'd have a problem. And so far, we've had great results. And for the sake of time, this isn't a clinical study, but it's something that's unique to our institution. Um, and this, one of our treatments for intransient metastases that are on the legs. So in transit metastases is you have the primary melanoma, and then you have the lymph node basins, and as you saw, the lymphatic vessels that travel in between. Now, what's called an intransit melanoma is when a, a lesion of melanoma that has spread from the primary melanoma in those lymphatic vessels has shown up in the skin and it's got, kind of gotten caught in between the lymph nodes and the primary melanoma, and it's called an intransit lesion. And typically, these have been very, very hard to treat. So something that has been done at Intermountain Healthcare that Dr. Antabaka is just bringing here to the Huntsman, protocols are going into place and we'll, we are going to start doing here, is something called for treating of intransit lesions, and this is just in the legs and they are isolated to the leg, is something called isolated limb infusion. What this is, is this is done in the operating room where they actually infuse into just the leg melphalan, which is a chemotherapy. This is done under hypoxic conditions or making the tissues starve for oxygen in the leg, which allows a better uptake and is, uh, makes the chemotherapy more effective. This is infused over about 30 minutes in the operating room. And this is something that is only done in about five sites around the United States. And we're lucky enough to have one of those sites here in Utah. It has a very good, when this, very few patients qualify for this, but when we do, when this is available, it has a very good response rate. The complete response being as high to 31 to 38 percent and a partial response 14 to 56 percent with a pretty good duration um, overall of uh, 24 months. 
and complete response patients. So just a brief, um, let you know what's, what's coming and, and how lucky we are here with a lot of the advances that we have. So um, picture speaks a thousand words. That's one of my favorites. But um, I just <laughs> wanted to say that, that this is a, uh, it is an excited time, exciting time for melanoma. And I too am a melanoma survivor and I've been through interferon. I don't know if I exactly want to thank Kirkwood, but I have been through it. So I am particularly, <laughs> this is particularly um, close to my heart and it's been so exciting. I've been here about a year and a half to see just the change and the amount that's available for patients. In the last year, this is an exciting time for melanoma and so many new things are popping up and I want to thank everybody here for all their dedication and it's been amazing to see. So thank you.